So in my humble, humble attempt is I will try to bring a word of God, which the choir has already done, but I ask for a little bit of grace as we hear these words from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. And I invite you to follow in the pew book or the pew Bibles or follow along on the screen. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I cannot reach it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me, even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously set up, marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in secret place. When I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And on your scroll every day was written that was being formed for me before any of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I try to count them, they outnumber grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think it is only fair to start out this particular sermon by telling you and telling everyone that I have a love-hate relationship with this particular text from the book of Psalms. I love it because of the imagery it gives us. The imagery which constantly reminds us that no matter where I go, no matter where we go, we are always surrounded by God's loving presence. That since the beginning, not only since the beginning of time, but since our beginning, my beginning, God has been there forming us, shaping us, filling us with love and light. This imagery reminds me, reminds us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of our loving creator and that through all of our lives, God will be there guiding us and holding us in the palm of God's hand. These are the reasons why I love this particular text. The reasons why I hate it are more personal. Pastorally, I have shared these words hundreds of times with families, with friends, even within this community of faith in times of great sorrow and pain, usually at a celebration of life service. I have looked in the eyes of loved ones and they have heard these words come out of my mouth. And I've offered these words in hope that they bring comfort, that they bring peace, that they bring some sort of solace in grief. And I could leave it at that. But the real reason I hate this text is even more personal than that. I hate this text because it was read at my daughter's funeral. Now, I'm the only one to blame because I chose it. The minister asked me, what words do you need to hear in that moment? And this image of Psalm 139 came to mind. These images that brought me love, that brought me comfort, that is what I needed to hear in that moment. But now every time I hear this text, every time I share this text, these images of comfort, these images of love are tinged by my grief. 
because I can remember sitting in these very pews, hearing these words offered by the minister that day. I can remember thinking to myself that this imagery offered by the psalm, this imagery of a God that loves me so much that God's comfort and grace surrounds me and holds me, this imagery that I love so much that brought me such delight is now accentuating my pain and sorrow. Because the God that the psalm describes, I didn't like the God at that very moment. I was angry at that God that very moment. And I just wanted that God to leave me alone. But that God kept following me. That God was always there. I wanted to be in the darkness. I didn't want God's light at that moment. Yet, as I sat in this very room and these sitting in these very pews, angry at God, trying to capture and use words that could not capture my grief, there was still this image of God being with me, surrounding me, and holding me. Although this happened 14 years ago, these were my thoughts this past week as I worked on this sermon. These were my thoughts which came to me this past week as I sat in workshop after workshop listening to experts detail the shifts that our communities of faith have experienced and continue to experience over the last three years. Shifts that have knocked our feet out from underneath us. Shifts that have us seeking answers to questions we don't even know what to ask yet. Shifts that remind us that everything we used to know no longer works and we're still trying to find our feet underneath us. Shifts that are now tinged with grief because everything has changed. 14 years later, these Thoughts about being angry with God, yet still needing that image of God's love. These were my thoughts as I heard this keynote speaker talk this past week. And I'm going to paraphrase this a bit. And if I don't get it exactly right, I'm asking for a little bit of grace. But in essence, this keynote seeker said, as a church, because we do not connect the pain in people's lives to the pain and suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross, we miss out on mission and ministry. And in doing so, we miss out on the healing power of the gospel message coming to life right there in our midst. You see, what I have often missed, what we often miss when we read these words from Psalm 139 is that we get frustrated. We get frustrated because God doesn't try to fix it. God is not there trying to make everything okay. We don't like the fact that God did not create the world, create this false sense of reality where everything in our lives is sunshines and rainbows. When we spend time with this text, oftentimes what we really miss is the gift that is laid out before us. Because what this psalm reminds us of each and every time we hear these words is that we have a God who comes along beside us in our grief and pain. We have a God who sits with us. We have a God who listens to us. We have a God who embraces us. We have a God who cares about us. In these words, even though they may be tinged with grief, in these words written by the psalmist some 2,000s or more years ago, what we do have is the healing power of the gospel message brought to life right here in our midst. Or let me say it this way. I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers. And as I said last week, and I'm going to say again this week, and I will probably say every week as long as we're doing this series. We're not doing this in the hopes that our grief goes away. That in six weeks, everything is fixed, everything is fine. What we are doing is trying to create space for God's love and grace to find us and fill us, to deal and to name some of the things that have broken our hearts over the last months, over the last years, over our lifetime. What will I will share is this past week, 
as I was in this conference and I sat in workshop after workshop and I kept hearing the word trauma keep popping up over and over again. I'm not kidding. It was like they had shared notes and it was like trauma this and trauma that and trauma, trauma, trauma. And every time this trauma was used to describe this collective trauma that we have experienced as a community, and it was centered down to our personal lives, that we've all experienced trauma, whether loss from jobs or relationships or death or sickness, this trauma was all captured in this idea of grief. And the weird thing is this idea of trauma and grief was always paired with an extend an invitation to pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening in that moment. Pay attention to what you're feeling. Pay attention to what's going on in your life. Pay attention to what's going around in the community, what's going on in the community around us. All of it was described as trauma and paired with this invitation to pair to pay attention. And that struck me as a very odd combination because when we're in the midst of our grief, the last thing we want to do is pay attention. Because what I want to do is pull the blankets over my head, never get out of bed, and pretend nothing's wrong. And if I ignore it long enough, it will go away. But here we are being extended an invitation to pay attention. And as I thought about this invitation... I thought about us as Midway Christian Church because I realized as a community of faith, as we are beginning to process our grief, we're in the unique position to connect the pain and suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross to the pain and suffering that people have had in their lives. And here's why I say this. And it doesn't take a genius. I could have skipped seminary and saved billions of money. Because it just comes down to this. We have not figured it all out. We don't have all the answers. But here's what we do know. As a community of faith, we know what it is like to not like God very much in a moment. To be angry with God in that moment. We know what it's like to say, God, just leave us alone. We know what it's like to sit and want to be in that darkness. We know what it's like to not want to be in the light because we've experienced that over this past year. And yet, the story did not end for us there. The story, even though now it may be tinged with our grief and those images of love which brought us comfort, we are still clinging to those. We are still experiencing the healing power of God's gospel message to us because we know what it is like to hurt. We know what it is like to have our feet knocked underneath us and yet hold on to the hope, hold on to the promise, to hold on to the grace. Because what we've discovered not through any choice of our own, and not because I think that it happened for any sort of reason. What I think happened, though, and what I believe happened, is that we now have an invitation to look at our woundedness. I'm borrowing from Henry Nowen right now. But to look at our woundedness, to find grace, to find hope, and to meet people in their wounds to find that Christ, to find that God who sits with us and holds us because that is what the world needs right now. Not more programs, not more ways to market and fancy up the gospel message. The world, the people, we simply need to hold on to that knowledge that our God cares for us that our God is not going to fix things and that God is not creating a false sense of reality. But we do have a promise, a promise that our God will come along beside us to sit with us, to meet us in our woundedness. 
And that is the gospel message, the healing power of the gospel message made real, coming to life right in our midst. And Midway Christian Church, that is what is needed in this moment. Amen.